So this presentation is about an NZEB retrofit case study. It's looking at the actual performance versus what you'd expect, what the predicted performance is. Uh, and my name is, is Shane Coakley. I work as a research fellow in UCD and also a principal consultant at Energy Expertise Limited. So it's about an NZEB scheme that were retrofitted. Um, I'll go through the overall project um, the academic project, if you like, in UCD in terms of the NZEB 101 project. Uh, just one slide on that. And I'll also go through the case study buildings themselves. What was done? What did they look like? Um, and most importantly, I'll have a talk to the occupants as part of this and present the findings from those interviews uh, as part of the, um, the overall um, data that was collected. And then have a look at the hard data. What were the interior temperatures? How much energy was saved in terms of kilowatt hours? Um, was that the same as predicted? Uh, so you're saving energy, what are the financial benefits? And then overall, if you look at the costs and the, the financial benefits, does this make sense? So that's the overall view of the presentation. Um, and here we are. So actual performance versus predicted performance. And I'll put that in the context of the NZ 101 project now. This is a three year research project. Uh, it's been run in UCD, uh, funded by SEAI. Um, I'm part of a team of four people, four academics, looking at um, uh, uh, 101 buildings that were retrofit to the NZEB standard and built to the NZEB standard. Uh, this is very much a, an industry uh, collaboration with academia. So you'll see a number of different competitors, sorry, a number of different uh, collaborators here. Uh, Michael Bennett and Sons long history of building to passive house and low energy standards. 3CEA are really an energy agency, a foremost uh, uh, energy agency in Ireland doing a lot of retrofit. Uh, Neelan is a company specialising in ventilation for low energy buildings and Massart company with over a decade's worth of experience in designing and building to low energy standards. In terms of the NZ 101 project itself, the objectives are to do a post-occupancy evaluation of 101 NZEB dwellings in Ireland. And it's about analysing the in-use performance of the fabrics, so the insulation, the, the ventilation, uh, and the technologies, heat pumps, solar panels, etc. And also asking the occupants what their perspective is. And the only reason we're doing this is really to uncover insights into the performance of this housing. And this is really the very first time that Ireland has embarked on a scheme of low energy buildings throughout the country. Um, it's a really strategic initiative uh, and we're gathering data now so that we'll have an evidence-based uh, decision-making process for the next iteration of the building regulations where it goes lower energy again. So we're, we're monitoring 101 uh, dwellings throughout Ireland. I'll talk about the case study dwellings that we're going to be talking about here and thanks to Patrick Brown of Brown's Photography who provided some lovely photographs of the scheme. Uh, this is a scheme of 12 houses. There are one bedroom, 31 square metre houses arranged around a square in Wexford. This is the photograph of them before being upgraded. They had oil fired central heating by and large. They also had electric storage heaters in some of them and open fires in others. Uh, and this was all replaced with uh, an up-to-date system which really went from the ground up. Here you'll see the insulation being applied uh, from ground level up, uh, up the walls. It's, and, it's just over 100 millimetres of external insulation right up to, to uh, ceiling level and, and um, roof level. And you'll see that this was done for each of the scheme of four terraced buildings. Here's a photograph you know, of the scheme finished. You'll see over on the left there a photograph, uh, an aerial photograph, and here's how it looks from the, the, the road. It looks really well. These homes look like new homes. Uh, there are solar panels on the roof, uh, upgraded windows and doors, everything is as it should be. And are the occupants satisfied? Well, the answer is yes, very satisfied. Um, here's an oc the occupant's perspective in terms of the winter. What are their perceptions of these dwellings after living in them for over a year um, and you'll see you know on a scale of one to seven is it still is the air still in terms of a score one or is it drafty on a, on a, um, a scale of seven 
Um, and you'll see the majority are saying it's quite still. One person is saying it's drafty. Uh, dry or humid, fresh, stuffy, odorless, smelly, uh, uncomfortable, comfortable. This is an interesting one. Have a look at that. Um, so on a scale of one where that's really uncomfortable, seven where it's really comfortable, what you're getting is two people scoring it the highest of seven, um, one person scoring it five out of seven, and the remainder then scoring it six. And then when it comes to too hot or too cold, vast majority are scoring it bang smack in the middle is just right. One person saying it's too hot in the winter. Uh, and you'll see overall, you know, if you look down the bottom, on a scale of one, which is really unsatisfied, or seven, which is very satisfied, the vast majority are scoring at seven, which is the top mark, two are scoring at six, and two scoring at five. So are the people happy here? The people are very happy here. Um, but this you know, is a fiendishly simple questionnaire. It's only a three-page questionnaire. Uh, and really what we're asking people to do is just, you can see it, score. Um, but what's an average score? Well, let's have a look. See over on the right, uh, the scale midpoint is four. So on a scale of one to seven, the midpoint is four. But in fact, the benchmark mean, you know, of all the, the dwellings that were analyzed through this methodology, not just here, but, you know, in the, in the, the, the full database, the majority of people scored at a 4.4. Whereas here, what we're seeing is 6.29 is the average score for this particular one, uh, which is conditions in winter overall. Now, how many people would score at a, at a 6.29? Um, this was the top score for this particular question, uh, for this particular database, of, uh, and it's a large database of dwellings. And over on the left, you'll see, you know, in terms of a summary, um, you'll see green is, is, is good, orange is less good, and then red is unsatisfactory. You'll see all bar one are scoring at green, uh, and some of them are really high scores. And again, looking at conditions in winter overall, you'll see just at the scale of four there, that's the mean in terms of the scale. But in fact, you'll see over in the top right there, uh, where people scored, it was a 6.3. Uh, and that is the very top. So it's the, the 100th percentile in terms of scores. So people were very, very happy in these homes. And then you look at the hard data in terms of the actual temperatures compared to what is predicted. So the temperatures are determined really in terms of what's, what's expected by this dwelling energy assessment procedure. This is the software, the national software, which is used to produce the building energy rating. So on a scale of one to, or on a scale of A to, to F. And this software assumes two heating periods. One is two hours in the morning, between seven o'clock in the morning and nine o'clock, uh, and six hours in the evening, between five o'clock and 11 o'clock. So this is what the software assumes uh, will be used in the house. And it assumes two set temperatures. It says in the living room, it's going to be 21 degrees Celsius, and in the rest of the dwelling, it's going to be 18 degrees Celsius. So what temperatures were actually recorded uh, during the winter in these homes? Well, on the right, you'll see eight homes, NZEB 22 up to 33, uh, and you'll see the range of temperatures. Uh, the, the line there, the red line at 21 degrees Celsius, is what the software assumes is the temperature that the heating system is set for between 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock. And again, you'll see 21 degrees between 5 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Now, Look at the temperatures. You see the temperatures are significantly over that, both in the morning and in the afternoon. And some of them are over it by a really large margin. So you'll see, you know, some of them are, are veering up towards, you know, that line in the middle, that's the median. That's, that's the 50% um, of temperature are above that and 50% are, are below it. And you'll see some of them have median temperatures of around 25 degrees throughout this period of the winter. So these are, these are warm temperatures. Um, and the dwelling energy assessment procedure, the deep software assumes again, for the purposes of, of putting in a building energy rating, that it's going to be 18 degrees Celsius for the rest of the, of the dwelling. Here's an example of the bedrooms. And you'll see the 18 degrees line there between 7 a.m. And, and, and 9 a.m. And again, between 5 and 11. Temperatures are nowhere near that. What we're seeing is consistently higher temperatures than the 18 degrees. Um, 
And this is, again doesn't change throughout the day. So the temperatures are up there, but they pretty much stay up there. So two trends are really emerging when it comes to the winter temperatures, the recorded winter temperatures over the full um, uh, three month period. We're seeing significantly higher than the set temperatures assumed by the energy rating software. Significantly higher, I mean 24 versus uh, 18 degrees. Um, and we're also seeing continuous temperatures. So the homes are heated and then they're kept there. The heating isn't turning on and off. Um, so this is, this is a, a significant finding. And remember we said that these underwent a deep energy retrofit. Well, you know, here we see they were coming from four buildings had an F rating, but the majority, eight of them, had a G rating, which is the very worst building energy rating. And all of them went up to A rated. And one of them was actually A1, the very highest rating. Nine were A2, and two of them were A3. So in terms of the performance of these buildings, you're really expecting lots. So what actually happened? It's all very well to sort of say these are A-rated dwellings in theory. What are they in practice? What I've done is I've measured the domestic hot water and the space heating and the energy consumption for those and compared those with the A-rated buildings uh, for using the BER. And this is what the result is. Over on the left, for NZEB22, you'll see that in the blue line, this is coming at 3,416 kilowatt hours of delivered energy, um, kilowatt hours for space heating and domestic hot water, and that's equivalent to an A2 rating from the BER. But actually, when you look at the recorded energy consumption for domestic hot water and space heating, you'll see that it was 5,879 kilowatt hours, and that's equivalent to a B1. So there weren't, it wasn't performing as an A rated building, it was performing as a B rated building in terms of its energy consumption. And you'll see down the bottom that it ranged from sort of 30% over what you'd expect to 138% over. So if you look at the top one there, 8,047 kilowatt hours, that's coming in as a C1 rating. Not at all the A2 that you'd expect. So this again was a significant finding. Um, these buildings, even though they're really low energy, um, they're being heated quite a bit and the energy consumption is reflecting that and they're cons considerably higher than what you'd expect from the BER. So where we had all A rated in terms of the building energy rating, in use we saw three were matching the energy consumption you'd expect for that A rating, four were B rated and one was actually C rated in terms of actual energy consumption. But before we, we leave that, you know, this isn't really a surprise because these homes were significantly higher temperatures and for longer than the building energy rating software would assume. But it will impact in terms of the cost benefit. Um, how does that work out? You know, were they consuming as much energy as anticipated? Uh, what about the extra cost? So in terms of costs overall, this project um, cost, you'll see in the bottom right there, uh, 298,000 euro plus VAT, so 340,000 euro in total. 50% uh, of that was received from SEAI as a grant because of the Deep Energy Retrofit Pilot Project. So the after grant cost was 12,500 um, per building. So in total, 25,000 uh, plus VAT per dwelling and the after grant cost was 12 and a half. What about the direct savings for the tenants in terms of heating and carbon dioxide? So I'm thinking carbon taxes are coming in, I assumed 70 euro per ton. It's currently, you know, between 20 and 30. So we're moving from F and G up to A. We're moving from oil-fired boilers with back, or oil-fired central heating and, and back boilers and putting in heat pumps. We're putting in solar PV panels. Uh, and we had a look at carbon tax as well in terms of this is coming in at about 70 euro per ton over the 15 year analysis period. So based on the A-rated BER, the average predicted heating cost is 274 euro. The actual heating cost based on the recorded energy consumption is coming in at 371 euro. So that might be a disappointment in that it's 35% higher than you'd expect if you were buying the house based on the BER. But you remember, the houses were performing exactly as people wanted. They were really satisfied. The temperatures were, were much higher, but that's because people wanted them higher. Um, 
And the other thing to remember is that the average heating cost before the deep energy retrofit, and this is where we actually asked people and also calculated it by means of the BER, the average heating cost per home was €1,415 Euro for the year. So this represents an actual reduction of 74%. So there's a 74% saving on the actual heating cost because of this deep energy retrofit. So you'll see a summary slide here down the bottom left. You'll see it costs 28,000, including VAT. Uh, the total direct benefits then in green were 23,000 euro per dwelling over 15 years. And this is broken down in terms of the actual heating saving of 15,700 over the 15 years and carbon dioxide savings, carbon tax of 5,100. And also Wexford County Council were reducing their maintenance costs because they didn't have to go out and service the oil boilers every year. Uh, and they also eliminated fire, chimney fire costs because there were no chimneys. <laughs> they were all boarded up. So if you look at a cost of 28,000 euro and a direct benefit of 23,300 euro, over 15 years, you're getting back 15, or sorry, 83% of your investment. So you're only getting your money back over 15 years and then savings continue to accrue. Interesting to see that there are 67%, two thirds of those are down to actual heating savings, but about a quarter were coming in in terms of carbon tax savings. So we've talked about the direct savings, you know, we're saving money in terms of heating those buildings and carbon taxes, and um, they're direct. But there's also a whole host of indirect. There are multiple benefits here. There's a pie, and this is the International Energy Agency's pie when it comes to the, uh, the savings. The direct ones are the ones that we've looked at in terms of the energy savings, the carbon taxes, and also the public uh, budgets in terms of reduced maintenance costs. But co-benefits, the, the extra benefits that are thrown in for free, if people aren't wasting money on heating, they're spending it in the local economy. So there are, and there are metrics around this in terms of how do you capture that? What's that energy saving like in terms of contributing to the GDP? And also, you know, we were hearing about, you know, people are very comfortable. A lot of people are, are, um, are vulnerable in terms of their health. There was one lady fell out of the bed uh, at two o'clock in the morning. And when the ambulance came the next day at 10 o'clock, they said, that the house was really warm and that she probably wouldn't have survived the night but for the fact that the house had, had, um, had a really nice comfortable temperature in it. Had she fallen on the floor before it was, it was done up, they said she probably would have been dead. Now, you can't put that into a spreadsheet, but there are metrics around the amount of money that's saved in the health service because the houses are good, healthy homes. People are employed in this and the asset values go up as well. So all of these benefits add up to the multiple benefits. Some of them are direct and some of them are co-benefits. So what about the, the building valuations? Would you buy one of these houses on the left or would you buy one of the houses on the right? Same house, deep energy retrofit is the only difference. We asked a local um, valuer um, and she said that the value of the property was an extra 35,000 per house. And she said there's a very good reason for this. They look like new homes. There's a real shortage of new homes to low energy standards for this particular demographic. You know, there are very few houses that they could buy that would be as good as this. But she said not only that, but you know, the price goes up, you know, so it's, it's a good financial investment. But she was saying the quality of life really is what was the big striking thing that she saw down there. And as well, putting extra money in their pockets. So in terms of the indirect benefits, the number that I looked at, the biggest one, was the building valuation. So for a cost of 28,000 euro, the property went up by 35,000. So this you know, means straight away you've got your, your cost covered. And you've got other benefits as well in terms of the health benefits. So the Department of Health should see their budget go down by 6,100 per dwelling over the 15 years. The GDP should go up by 2,300 per dwelling over the 15 years. And these are all good things. And what they mean is that the total indirect benefits of this uh, 25,000 euro upgrade uh, is coming in at 43,400 euro. This is just co-benefits, not even direct benefits, just co-benefits. So again, looking at it purely from a financial perspective, you've got a cost here of 339,000 euro 
for the scheme of 12 houses. You've got direct benefits of 280,000 euro, but you've also got indirect benefits of 521,000 euro over the 15 year period. So the total benefits financially are coming in at 821,000 euro. So this means that for your investment, you're getting 2.36 times back over 15 years. And the conclusion is, this project is financially attractive. Would you do it as a, as a private landlord? Absolutely you do it as a private landlord. This, this makes perfect sense. It works for everybody. So let, what about those, those people? What about the different stakeholders and the different stakeholder groups? Well, let's have a look. The tenant is, as we saw, you know, in terms of the, the occupant satisfaction survey, very happy with the upgrade. These homes are transformative. In the past, they used to have to wipe the mold off the walls. They used to have to paint them every year. These were uncomfortable, you, you might even say dangerous homes in terms of health. Um, and they're seeing their heating bills reduced from 1,415 on average down to 371 euro on average. And here's the thing, all of the people there, I guess, are on um, fuel allowance of 840 euro per annum. So they still get the fuel allowance, but have a look at that fuel allowance, it's 840 euro per annum. Which actually, if you look at the saving, the saving is coming out at over a thousand. So they're actually, you know, rather than wasting this fuel allowance on, on heating, they're saving more than that in terms of their heating bill. So this is a, this is a really good outcome. And, and they're still continuing to get the, the, the fuel allowance. The government is looking at this and they, they pay the most. You know, in terms of VAT and in terms of 50% of, um, of the upgrade costs through SEAI, they pay 193,000 euro for the scheme of 12 houses. And they enjoy benefits back of 162,000 in terms of avoided carbon penalties, in terms of increased GDP, in terms of reduced health liabilities. And one thing that I should point out, taxes aren't included here. So while the government is paying 193,000 euro, if you take the VAT off that, I mean, they're essentially paying this out and then recovering the VAT. The salaries that people are paid, these people are being paid, are, are paying income tax. So if you actually included the tax, you'd find that the government is very happy with this project. And have a look at the local authority or indeed a housing association. They're paying 50% of the upgrade costs and that's coming in at 146,000 euro. And the direct benefits that they see are reduced maintenance costs because they don't have to service the oil boilers uh, and reduced chimney fire costs. So over the 15 years for these 12 homes, that's coming in at 31,000 euro. So they're paying 146,000 and they're getting direct benefits of 31,000. So that's a bit of a struggle. But then you might say, well, look, there are indirect benefits there as well. And we have a look at the indirect benefits for the housing association and local authority. They're 420,000 euro primarily due to the increased value of the properties. But actually, this benefit is totally irrelevant to a housing association or a local authority. They're not going to be selling the, the, the properties on and realizing a profit. Um, and equally, they don't see any increased income for the investment. So they can't make the investment and have it then paid for over a period of time. So we're in a situation where the housing associations or local authorities would look at this see scant direct benefits, significant upgrade cost, uh, and they don't have any way of funding that shortfall. And they're the decision maker. So while the tenant is very happy, uh, the government is very happy, which is us as, as, as people you know, in, in the country, uh, the people making the decision in terms of whether to upgrade these houses or not, the local authority or the housing association, are significantly disadvantaged financially. And that's a worry. So in terms of conclusion, what does the data say? We've gathered lots of data, we've asked people. Um, the climate bill has just been announced this week. Um, we need to retrofit 50,000 homes every year until 2030. 15,000 of those are social housing, exactly the demographic that we see for this. We see life-changing benefits for the tenants. We see benefits of significant benefits, so it's 28,000 euro investment and the property value goes up at 35,000 euro. So from a purely financial point of view in terms of an investment, this makes great sense. 
We also see direct benefits of over 80% of the, direct, of the um, deep energy retrofit costs over a 15 year period. So not only do we get our money back in terms of the investment, but we also see direct benefits will accrue, which will accrue over 15 years of 80% of those costs as well. And we also see indirect benefits overall accruing to 230% of the costs. So the indirect benefits add significantly. We've got over two times our costs recovered over the 15 year period. And then we see the housing association and the local authority only enjoy a very small direct benefit, but yet are the decision makers. So what this says, what the data says, uh, we won't see a big uptake in this as far as housing associations and local authorities are concerned. We really do need to focus on this stakeholder group and come up with some innovative incentives um, to try and un unlock this. And if we do unlock it, there are significant benefits for everybody. Everybody wins. So I'd just like to thank you for your attention. Uh, my contact details are there, shane at energyexpertise.net and shane.coakley at ucd.ie. Um, what I do is I focus on evidence-based decision-making for low energy buildings um, from both an academic and also from a, a commercial perspective. Post-occupancy analysis getting more and more important and I'm seeing this and getting more and more involved in that. And also financial and economic analysis, strategy and business case development. So thank you for your attention.